Hey everybody, this is Games Plus James, and welcome back to our Unity 2D tutorial series where we're taking a look at all the elements you need to make your own awesome game full of platforming action and platforming goodness. Uh, now today we're going to look at adding a flying enemy to the game to assault the player and put you in danger in lots of different situations. But before we do that, I want to talk about some news of my own. A lot of the elements we've used in this series have come from my own game that I've been making, Portal Knots. Portal Knots is a retro 2D platforming action adventure game featuring multiple characters that you can switch between and each one has its own unique abilities and they're combining to use their skills to fight an evil invading force all across the multiverse. I've now launched a Kickstarter campaign to help raise funds to complete the game and if you follow the link on screen now you can go there and check it out for yourself and try out the free demo of the game to get a taste for what the final game will feel like. If you pledge as an early backer, you can get the game at a special price, only available on Kickstarter, or you can also get other awesome rewards, like the game's soundtrack, an art book featuring the artwork and concept art from the game, or you can even get to design some items, enemies, levels, or have yourself put into the game. If you found this tutorial series helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you could go there now and help make a fun game together. So make sure and check it out, and today we're going to look at making some flying enemies for the game. So. I've added a little bit more to the art file that we're using in the game. Uh, so what you need to do is open the, the current art file. No, not open. Show an explorer. Here we go. Uh, and we want to copy over the new one. So you'll have to download that as usual as we've done throughout the series so far. And you just take that one, copy it, paste it over the one that already exists. Because again, you don't want to drag it straight into Unity or else it'll create an extra duplicate object and that's not what we want to do. So we're going to uh, add or select the new enemy sprites. This is a new flying enemy that we've added in. He's nice and simple, not too complicated. Uh, so we'll just draw a few boxes around this guy. Make sure they're all the same size. Like this. I could make them the same, same size to start off with. I wouldn't have to resize them, but that's okay. And we'll just name them something simple so we'll just say like flying flying no flying so flying one let's copy flying two flying three and flying four perfect so we'll just grab our flying one we'll just pop one of him in here here in the first level we might as well work in this one so we pop him down just round about here and you can see he looks fits in with the rest of our art style that we have get, got going on here uh, and we're going to make a little animation for him so we're going to go to animation here and we'll create a new clip we'll put this in the animations folder uh, and we'll just call this um, flying enemy float because all he's going to do, he's, just, he's only going to have one animation that he's just to make his little thing on top of his head spin around basically. So we'll just select the four of these, pop them in there like that. We'll put our speed down to about 12 I think. And if we just zoom in on him here, actually if we just move him down in front of this thing so he's a bit more obvious. And if we hit play. There we go. So it looks like the thing is kind of rotating around just a little bit. It's pretty basic, but it does the job that we want. Uh, so now we've got our enemy, and now we need to give him some things to do. Because at the moment he's just sitting there doing nothing. So we need to add a way for him to hurt the player, and of course a way for him to be hurt. So we're going to add a circle collider to him. Circle collider 2D. And we'll make that a trigger. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit too big compared to the rest of them. So what we'll do is we'll pull that down just a tiny bit and we'll pull it up a tiny bit oh no that's the wrong one that's not up why is up so there we go just pull it up a tiny little bit um because you want to kind of have it inside the radius sometimes so that the player can like get close without being hurt by it um so yeah here's a circle player we need to add uh, enemy health to him much as we've created in other episodes so we'll give him a health of say 3 and say we'll give him 50 points on death and we'll give him the death particle explosion that we've used before uh, and then what do we need? We need a player, hurt player, that's what it is, sorry. Hurt player on contact. So we'll 
Every time we hit the player, we'll give him one damage, I suppose. So that's perfect. Uh, we also need to copy from the other enemies. When the when they get hurt, they make a little noise. So we need to take the noises they make. We're going to copy that component. If you right click on the drop down menu here, or if you just left click on it. So in any way, if you click on this menu here, and then we'll you know, copy that, and then click on one of these other one, ones here, and we'll go paste component as new. So now we had that there. We don't have to go hunting through our project folder to look for it or anything like that. Um, and now we've got our enemy. Uh, at the moment though, he doesn't really move around or do anything. We kind of want him to be able to do something. So if we if we go near him now, he's just kind of floating and hovering there. We can throw things at him. Oh, we haven't made him an enemy. So that he, that's why he's not dying or anything. We need to give him an enemy tag and put them on the enemy layer so we play it again and now we should be able to like do a little bit of damage to him do a little bit of have a little bit of fun with him there we go he's destroyed and just to make sure he's hurting the player as well we want to make sure and walk into him so once it runs here we'll jump over this and then there we go we're getting hurt every time we hit him perfect so now, obviously, we want them to be able to move around. We can't just use the same script we've used for our, for these enemies that just kind of walks between certain points. We want to do something different with him. What what we're going to do with this guy is, whenever the player gets in a certain range of him, we're going to make him move towards the player. Because we don't want them always moving towards the player for the whole level. Say if you have a huge, big, massive, long level here, and you have the, one of these floating guys over in this area, then you don't want him, as soon as level starts, him slowly making his way over here to the enemy, or to the player, and then killing them. What you want is him to just hang around in this area, and then if the player gets to about here, say, then he goes, oh, the player's near me, I better go get him. And then he just slowly moves towards him and starts trying to hit into him. Because that's all he does, he doesn't have any other attacks or anything like that at the moment. He's just trying to bash into the player and give him a little bit of pain. So, we need to create a script to be able to handle that. So we'll go down here and we'll create a C-sharp script and we'll call this, call it flyer enemy move. And we'll open this up in mono develop. Once this decides to go, there we go. Okay, so we've got a few values that we're gonna want to use in our, in our script here. We'll want to be able to find the player itself. So we're going to do private player, player controller, which finds the script that the player is attached, the main script is attached to the player. And we call this the player. And then in our start function, we'll make it find that. So we'll go the player is equal to find object of type uh, player controller. Perfect. And then we want to, obviously we want to give it some kind of speed that it can move with. So we'll give it public float move speed. Uh, and we'll want a certain amount of range that, the, uh, that it looks for the player within. So public float uh, player range. Okay, so first we'll just make sure that it works to just move towards the player. We won't even worry about checking to see if the player's in range just yet. So what we'll do is, we'll go, we'll basically just move the, the position of the flying enemy every every second, every update frame. So we'll just say uh, transform, transform dot position is equal to vector tree dot move towards. And we've used move towards in our moving platform script a little while ago and as we did then move towards just moves it between whatever point you start at to whatever point it, you wanted to go towards by a certain amount of speed so as you can see we've got vector tree current vector tree target and max distance delta uh, so what we'll do here is our current position is just transform dot position and we want it to go towards the player's position so we'll say the the player dot transform dot position and the speed we want to go with is the move speed that we're going to set 
multiplied by time dot delta time which again as we used before is just time to delta time is the amount of time it's been since the last frame update that, that the screen went through so it's like 0 0.05 of a second or something like that um, so we'll save this and we'll go back into the game here and we'll go to our flying guy and we're going to add the flyer script no if it, it's just compiling the script there so we need to wait for that second here we go flyer enemy move so there we go we've got that on him and we'll say we move speed we don't want him to move super fast so we'll set his move speed just to two and player range doesn't matter at the moment but we'll just set it to 10. so now if we play we should see him move down towards the player here there we go, he's slowly getting towards the player and he just keeps moving towards him, so well if he doesn't if he doesn't die. Uh we just play again here. We should see that as the player moves, he'll change his course. He'll follow you around wherever you go. Just waiting to be your friend. So yeah, that's basically that's the basis of the little movement code, but we want to do something a little bit we want to have a little range that the, that he can find you in. So if we go into our asset script here, we want to be able to to see the range of the enemy. If we're going to be laying at the end, laying at the levels, we want to be able to visually see how how much of a range the enemy has. So what we're going to use is a as a a little section that we haven't done before, but down here below update, we're going to go void on draw gizmos. If I could spell on draw gizmo selected. And we use our little brackets and then we'll go down here. And then within this, we're just going to say gizmos gizmos dot draw sphere. And what that will that'll do is basically just in, in the editor, it'll draw a circle around or a sphere around the uh, the flying enemy object. Just so you'd be able to see what kind of range and effect it will have. So we give them us that draw sphere and we'll say transform that position as the center point and then as the size of the circle we'll have player range. And we need to close the bracket there first. Perfect. So now we'll save this. We'll go back in here. And once that compiles, we should see a big circle appear in front of our enemy here. Yep, there we go. So that's the, the range we've given it and you can see it's a big massive circle. It's quite big and it's helpful for us to be able to for us to be able to lay out our levels and drag it around and stuff like that. Uh, but obviously it kind of gets in the way. It's hard to what if you need to click on some other things that are behind it and stuff like that. Obviously when the enemy isn't selected it disappears but if we select them again it's hard to see exactly where you're clicking when you click off it so if we if you want to just get rid of that if you go to gizmos here and see our flyer enemy move script you turn that off and now it doesn't show up the circle whenever you click around on anything else or even if you click back on it the circle doesn't show up anymore it's just, it's just a handy way to get rid of it uh, but we'll leave it on for now and um, we'll actually make his range a little bit smaller as well just for our purposes there we go kind of a bit more player movement and freedom before you run into the enemy. Uh, so now we know how much of an area is around the the bad guy, but we need to be able to detect whether the player is in the range. So what we're going to do to do that is, much as we've used the, la we use the layer mass function to determine when the player is on the ground, so it does a little, little, it does a little circular check to check whether the ground below them is in range. We're going to do the exact same thing with our flyer enemy, but we're going to make it search for the player. So what we're going to do is public layer mask. Uh, and we'll call this player layer. And we're going to add a public bool. It could, this could be public or private, but just for public, just so we're able to see it in the inspector nice and handily. Public bool um, in or say player in range. Bang. Okay, 
So then in our update function here, so we have our movements all done. Basically, we don't want it to move unless the player is in range. So we're, what we're going to add here now is if if player in range. So what that says is if player in range is in, is true, then if we wrap these brackets around it, then it will execute this bit of code only if player in range is true. But we haven't set up how it's checking if the player in range is true at the moment. So what we need to do here is player in range is equal to physics 2d dot overlap uh, overlap circle which will that'll just draw a circle from a certain center point and at a certain radius and it'll look for anything with the layer that we've assigned player layer into so so to fill out the rest of this it'll be um, the transform dot position and the radius will be the range so player range and the layer will be player layer. So now it'll know to check for the player in the in that radius and range, and it'll only move it's with if it's within that range. So now we need to go back into the game here. An important thing to do now is I don't think we've done it before, but we set up a player layer before, but we never assigned it to our player. So here in our layer section here, we want to click on this and it'll drop that. There we go. We want to make sure he's assigned to the player layer. Uh, no, we don't change children. We just change the main one and then back on our flying guy we Go down here and we select the player layer We we'll select this in equal to the player so then we'll know that the player That is looking for anything on the player layer and there should only be one thing on that layer, which is the player So much rhyming going on here. It's ridiculous <laughs> and now if we play What we should find is he'll stay still there. He won't do anything for the moment and then as we go into that circle, this should get a little tick down here and it'll start moving towards the player. So we go over here. Here we go, starts moving. The tick is there. We can move out of his range again if we can. Oh, no, he's too fast for us. If we go over here, now we go. We're too far out of his range, so we stop moving again. If we go back towards him again, wait for him to get close enough and we can kill him and destroy him. So there you go. That's how you can make him move once he gets within a certain range. But you might want to do something a little bit extra as well. So think of, for example, the um, the ghost enemies in Mario. When you are walking towards them, they don't move. But when you turn your back on them, that's when they start coming towards you. Um, so how hard would it be to add something like that? And it turns out not very hard at all. What we'll do is add just a couple of extra things in here. Um, we'll add another public bool. Uh, facing away so we'll know whether the player is facing away from the enemy or not and we'll add another public bool follow on look away and we'll basically just use this to determine if we want this particular floating enemy to only behave like that so we'll only follow the player if the player is not looking at him and if he's not then they'll just follow him if the player is in range so we'll do that. So down here, what we're going to do is after our player in range function, so here we'll add an extra bit. If the player, uh, no, sorry, if not follow on look away. So if it's not following on look away, then this whole section we want to put in there. So we'll fill that in like that and we'll just tab these bits over just so that they so that it looks sensible so if it's not following and look away then we'll do it the exact same way that we just did a second ago and after it does that bit it'll return so it won't go on and do any of the extra code that we're about to write here so now down here if we want to get the player's position basically and determine whether he's facing away or facing towards the enemy. So if the player dot transform dot position dot x, so if his x position is less than the transform no not, not capital T, small t transform 
dot position dot x. So if the player's x position is less than the flying enemy's x position, so basically if the player's on the left hand side, so if the player's on the left hand side and he's facing to the left, that's how we'll know if it's true. And the way we know if the player's facing to the left is if the player oh no. If the player dot transform dot local scale dot x is less than zero. So if the player's local scale is minus one, then he's facing left and if he's also on the left hand side of the enemy, then we know that the value that we want is true. So we'll say facing away is equal to true. Perfect. And we want to do the exact same thing for the other side. So what we'll do is we'll just copy this and we'll just for a second, we'll just paste it down here just so we can see what we're doing without moving back and forward. Uh, we want to say if he's on the right hand side. So instead of the X being less than the flying enemy's X, we'll say it's greater than, oh, you can't see that, sorry. Uh, it, was, it was less than, now we'll say great than, greater than. And we want to say the local scale is greater than zero. So for when the player is facing right. So now when the player is on the right hand side of the enemy and he's facing right, that means he's facing away. So rather than adding another if statement here, what we'll do instead is we'll put uh, an extra bracket around this whole section. And we'll grab this and we'll cut it. And before the last bracket, we'll paste it in. Why didn't that? Hold on. Cut that. Paste that. There we go. And then between these, we're going to add a, a little or statement. So we'll do put these two little pipes in there like that. That means or. So basically, if the player is on the left hand side and facing left, or if the player is on the right hand side and facing right, then facing away is equal to true. And else, so if neither of those things is true, then facing away is equal to false. So now down here, what we'll say is we'll do the same little bit of code that we had here. So we'll just copy that and paste it in there. And then we'll say if the player is in range and also if player in range and facing away is true, then it'll do the movement. And we don't need this return because this is going to be the end of the statement anyway. So now we'll save this. We'll go back into the game. Wait for it to compile down the corner here. And then we we'll click on our flying enemy, go down here, and now we've got a few options. So we want to make sure he does follow and look away. And if we walk, get the player. If we walk into range now, we should see the player in range tick light up. Now we're here. So the player in range tick light up. He's not moving towards us because we're facing right. Although our, our player sprite doesn't actually have any kind of facing uh, value on him. So you can't really tell. But last input that I made was right, so he's facing right. Now if we go over to the left, oh, he's coming towards us. Look back, he stops. Go over the other side of him, look back again, he stops. Perfect. So that's basically how you'd have the same little kind of Mario enemies that we've had in the past. And if you want to do something similar yourself, there you go. That's how to add a nice little flying enemy to the game and have a little bit of fun with that. So yeah, thanks for watching everybody. This has been another Unity tutorial episode. And just as an example, this is another feature that I've implemented in a very similar way in my own game, Portal Knots. So as I said earlier, go check out Portal Knots on Kickstarter, try out the free demo and help make a game together. Thanks for watching this episode and I'll see you all for more gaming goodness very soon.